I got a few ready. Okay. I'll make you the presenter. All right. All right. Uh, this one was seen by my colleagues yesterday. That was a cool case. Um, so chest radiograph, some abnormal linear hyperdensities here, uh, and the right hyalum also. So this was a chest radiograph and then a combined skeletal survey. I think it was for presumed for multiple myeloma, but uh, just looking for lytic lesions. But on the skeletal survey, I included a few of the images. So methyl metacrylate, and then what's interesting is what this is. So these linear uh, hyperdensities there look like uh, look like catheters, uh, but but uh, but this is probably just uh, linear met methyl metacrylate that got into the veins. And this might be the IVC. I, I, the reason I uh, we don't have a CT on this case, but I do I did pull up a case uh, that I had seen previously. And so you can see. Uh, this case here, you can see the methyl methacrylate in this case uh, got into the azagous vein um, here. And um, then you can kind of see the same kind of linear structure right there coming up. So yeah, that's cool. Your case is really neat because it's, it's so thin that you're right, it looks like a catheter or a wire. It's, and it's it, yeah, regular. And for a while, yeah. I, I, we we couldn't figure this out initially, but then I was able to f pull up that case. So I was like, because this looks like a. Initially, the thought was this is a wire, but that there's no op report in our in our chart, so I'm not sure where this was done. So I couldn't dig that up. Uh, but uh, but but this is also too me too anterior to be azagous, right? Or and it's also too anterior. But so I'm assuming this is IVC here. I don't I don't see what other vein this would be going into. Uh, but you can see it coming up here also. It's so cool. Uh, this is interesting. Hopefully one day we'll get a CT of this case. Um, this one is just a fun, quick case. Uh, this guy, he's a 40 uh, young man, no past medical history, uh, early 40s. I read his CT chest. Yeah, yeah. Um, pull up the one I read yesterday. So I, I read his scan yesterday, and it was just a follow up. Uh, so saw this. Um, and he's an outpatient, so I saw this. And usually, I mean, it looks obviously bronchitis here. Uh, some 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 degree of fibrosis here in the hilum. Uh, in this part of the country, we I mean, so we started thinking about endemic fungi here with some some fibrosis also here associated with this tree and bud. So you start thinking about endemic uh, fungi. This part of the country you typically see histo. That's by far the most common. Uh, so I scroll down. I didn't see anything in the um, spleen as far as calcifications. This isn't like the classic look for uh, for uh, for self self uh, self limiting histo, so you, you know we don't see this much uh, soft tissue tree and bud, or you see the calcified nodules. Uh, so looked at the chart, and uh, turns out we looked at also looked at his priors, but he started having symptoms in 2018, and shortly after he was in Arizona for a business trip, and he'd been going to Arizona a few times, but started having uh, cough. Uh, just continuous cough after that. So this was his, this was the initial scan uh, from 2018, and uh, another 2018, a few months later. So this was biopsied, and then all the biopsy just showed uh, bronchitis and chronic bronch bronchiolitis, uh, but no, nothing grew. But still, the presumptive di diagnosis here was uh, was coxy and uh, symptomatically improved. So you just had chronic uh, chronic uh, coxy infection, presumably, but that, that makes the most sense. But I thought it was it was fun for me because we don't see, we almost never see coxy here. Uh, you, guys are, you guys are a lot more experienced with coxy. Yeah, and it doesn't uh, take much. It? 
Oh, go ahead. I was wondering if that, you guys think that makes sense. Um, well, I mean, it doesn't take much coxie to get coxie. So um, it's even just going for business. But you wonder if all the distal stuff is because of the broncholis and not the other way yeah, around. Yes. It actually so is the, his stow with the broncholis the that stuff. led to the bronchiectasis and distal obstruction. Because, I mean, I'll, I'll defer to Seth and Howard and David and Travis who've seen more of this. But, I mean, I've not seen coxy usually cause calcified hyalur lymph nodes like histo typically does so some of the distal stuff is new so some of this uh stuff right here is mm -hmm. is new on on this scan it wasn't there in 2018 so this is uh this is just post obstructive just mucus uh buildup most likely here and he's he's a asymptomatic at this point so they did bronch a while ago, and they did just set of obstructive bronchitis here. So yeah, yeah, you're right, Jeff. Some of this stuff is post obstructive. Yeah, that's what I, I really, I, I don't know. I, I favor this being histo broncholith and secondary, just chronic stuff. When they bronched them, were they able to debride any of that, or they just? No, I don't think so. I didn't see. So you think this is still histo? I do. I, I mean, I don't know what the other guys think, but I've not seen, I mean, I've seen a fair amount of coxie just because we have a lot of snowbirds over the years and people have shared cases, but I've not yeah. seen, I've seen it cause calcifications in cavity, like chronic cavities, but I've never seen calcified lymph nodes from coxie and like sort of, and I've never seen broncholis from coxie. Yeah, I, I don't think I've seen that yeah. either. Uh, so how about the spleen? Part of the discussion was, what, how is the diagnosis of coxie made? It wasn't. It wasn't. A, it wasn't made officially. It was just. It was just. He. The symptoms started shortly after he was in Arizona. But it. But it kind of self resolved on its own. So nothing grew. So no. Where, is he, is, where does he live normally? Is he in? He lives here in Atlanta. Where? Atlanta. I mean, I think. I think it's Histo. Okay. I, I've not seen Coxie do this. Okay. Okay. And uh, the other case I was going to show was from one of my colleagues, uh, Stefan Tigges. He he uh, posts he posts some of his interesting cases on uh, Radiopedia, so this, we're going to show it off Radiopedia. Uh, here, and we'll start with this chest radiograph. So, uh, you have nodules. Uh, this nodule, you can see a little cavity there. Mm -hmm. uh, here's the lateral. So, here's the chest CT showing the nodules. And here's a chest uh, hand radiograph. And so the finding, main findings here are uh, some osteopenia and then joint space loss, metacarpal phalangeal, and the carpal bones. Yep. There may be some radial erosion. And some other radiographs here is the C spine, and on the key images on the flexion, there is uh, increased space. Uh, the dense and the lateral dense uh, interval is increased on flexion. So that suggests, suggests a transverse ligament tear. So this is a patient with uh, rheumatoid arthritis and necrobiotic nodules. Very nice. Yeah, oh, that's a very good case. Very nice example of those nodules. Yeah. Yeah, and all the features. Was he on a necrobiotic diet? <laughs> Necrobiotic diet. <laughs> oh, 
that's all I have, guys. Great, thank you. All right, those are great, thanks. All right, who would like to, let's see, Seth or Travis? Do you uh, yeah, me? I can go real quick. All right. Here I don't know how real quick it's gonna be, but we'll see. Uh, I'm gonna move this to this screen. This screen. All right. Uh, man, I'm losing my mind because I don't. Okay, let's go. I'll just do this one at a time. This is a patient who, I mean, I don't know. It, it, just some mild. This is 2018. Uh, some mild reticulation. I mean, there's a few little areas of maybe some peribronchiolar ground glass. Uh, patient was asymptomatic at the time. She had a history of uh, ovarian malignancy that was a low grade and resected and hadn't really had any issues. I mean, you, you could formulate there may be some lobules, but she was an older patient and having some hyper attenuated lobules, I'm sorry, low attenuated lobules isn't that uncommon. This is then, <laughs> uh, I'll try to go in order here. This is then uh, now three years later and the abnormality has progressed mildly, not dramatic, but there is some progression of, you know, a little bit of ground glass, again, some reticulation. You can see maybe, well, here kind of some septal thickening. Um, I wouldn't know if I would call it a crazy paving pattern, but maybe a little bit of a crazy paving pattern. A patient was asymptomatic. And then I'll just fast forward to more recent where she started becoming symptomatic. Oops, those are, well, just, these are prone images. Uh, now you can see there's more dramatic, uh, crazy paving, a lot of ground glass nodules. Let me just go to the actual, just so you can see that there's really no, um, any real air trapping, nice kind of uh, normal expiration. Well, not normal, because the lungs aren't normal, but uh, no air trapping. So here's her CT, uh, thinner slices. And and again, she's like 82 years old. Um, uh, worsening dyspnea, uh, relatively diffuse. I, I don't know if someone would say probably it's, sorry, noisy images, but upper lobes are probably slightly more severely involved. And at this time I saw, I read the study at this time and I was, you know, kind of struggling for a differential of slowly progressive parenchymal abnormality. Um, she underwent uh, a bronch and based, well, based on what I said, I said, you know, I don't know how much of a differential people would give. It's really not a lot of fibrosis. Again, the main finding really is this kind of ground glass septal thickening. And even though the patient's in her 80s and really has no prior history, you know, I said, you know, it could be something like amyloid. We've seen amyloid do stuff like this, um, you know, getting into a weird differential. But I said it could be even PAP. Uh, she didn't have any infection, you know, any signs of immunocompromise, wasn't pneumocystis. Anyway, so they did a bronchial lavage and this was PAP. Um, mm. I just, and she died. So she, then they bronched her, they washed her out and then they left. Somehow they only got, they put in like six liters into the left lung. They only got like four back. Um, and she crumped and the family decided to guess she, again, cause again, she was old and frailish. Anyways, I'm curious how much, and we know there's secondary causes of PAP. She's going to undergo autopsy. But so far, all the secondary causes, she had no signs of a connective tissue disease. I mean, she did have a malignancy, but it was a low-grade lesion. Has anyone seen PAP in a, I have the past slide somewhere, in someone this old? Odd. Very odd. No, that's an odd look. Yeah. Um, but the path was pretty, yeah. Anyways, and I know Travis shared a, case report of, you know, central lobular nodules, diffuse central lobular nodules being PAP. Um, but anyways, that's what it was. 
uh, let's see, I don't remember what this case is. What is this case? Oh, you know, we've shown a couple of these cases. I Well, I sh showed one many years ago, and I, I was looking at the um, some of the case lists, and someone had shown a similar case. So this is, I, I don't, I mean, again, I just don't know what to do with these things. So this is one of those weird subplural emphysematous cystic airspace enlargement with fibrosis, whatever you want to call it, because I don't know what to call it, that shows you know, dramatic collapse on expiration. So here it is on the inspiration. And I remember seeing, and here it is on expiration. And then there's, here's another case, two different patients. Um, and I'm just curious what, now this patient's got some pretty nice, <laughs> some pretty nice lung injury. Uh, almost all of this was smoking related, believe it or not. But, an, uh, you know, what do you do when you see just large conglomerate cystic spaces in the lower lobes like this? <clears throat> and then here is the expiration. Unfortunately, we just got it through the base. This is an outside study, but you can see those areas do collapse. Um, so I'm just curious what people call this kind of stuff. If so, anyone is Seth, I showed one that's probably what you're referring to. I showed one a few weeks ago when I think it was yeah, David exactly David or something, or maybe David and Howard. But yeah, I you're, it wasn't as um, severe as yours, but the lower lobe cystic spaces, for lack of a better word, completely collapsed, whereas the upper yeah. lobe emphysema didn't. And it was a patient with RA who smoked. Um, and I mean, so presumably it's communicating. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what to call it either. I, I suspect it's a com combination of emphysema with fibrosis. Yeah, I mean, it, it's clearly connected with an airway. I mean, it wouldn't collapse otherwise. And it's just strange to have this. The second patient I have to see, besides a smoker, she might have had a connective tissue disease because that lower lobe cystic change looks so connective to tissue disease, like. Um, right. But uh, the first one was not. That was just a smoker. Uh, and it's just strange. Like the more we get expiration scans on these, the more I see these large conglomerate subplural things that in the lower lobes that collapse. Um, anyways, it looks like my Terra is broken for the time being. So why don't I stop there? And maybe come back a little bit later once this starts working again. Okay. Um, Travis. Yep. I can show some. This is courtesy of a colleague um, who's in a private group in Texas who saw this. And I think the interesting thing about this one is that we have a lateral to go with it. Uh, I've, sh I've shown a case recently, or maybe two cases, where it was an axillary placed intraortic balloon pump that was being displaced into the, uh, into the ascending aorta. And you can see in this case as well, here's the, the axillary access and this is the proximal tip. You can actually see this nice because it's inflated during uh, during diastole. You can see the gas in the lumen of the aortic balloon pump. And then the distal tip, of course, is this is too short. So even on the PA view, you know there has to be some overlapping of this. You know, it's, it's taking a curved uh, course to be that short. But we also see it on the lateral view. You can see in the ascending aorta and then also in the descending aorta. So was an outpatient, I guess, who's awaiting heart transplant and and was ambulatory, so they had a, 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 a PA and a lateral for an improperly placed intraortic balloon pump within the ascending aorta. That's one of the reasons they like the axillary approach because it enables the patient to ambulate. Right, and uh, yeah, so they, uh, yeah, this is just cool that we had a lateral view for it. So buckled into the um, arch for a bit. What's that? It buckled into the... Yeah, right. So it buckled into the ascending, right, and then goes back into the descending. So, and the one I showed, it, it had buckled in the ace, in in the more proximal ascending aorta as well, but I don't think that's the case here. Travis? And the patient was asymptomatic, so... Hey, Travis. Yeah. Hey, it's Anurag. What's up, man? Hey, what's up? 
um, it's a cool case, but just as small, just a small thing. If he's got a balloon pump, there's no way it's an outpatient. It's, he's got to be in the hospital for that. So um, no, there there is a particular um, balloon pump that's manufactured for the purpose of outpatient um, support. I forget the product name, but it's placed and manufactured for that particular purpose. Oh, I would love to hear the actuary. Yeah, Andrew, I asked that one. same question because yep. I couldn't believe it either. Yep. There may be more than one. I know of at least one that oh. is manufactured and for that particular purpose to be used via the axillary approach in an outpatient setting. Uh, I have not ever heard that. I'd love to hear the name of it. I can, I can yeah, I'd have to. I've yeah. got one in the teaching file. I showed one a couple, a year or two yeah. ago in the webinar. I'm wrong. In this case, if there's maybe, more. maybe my colleague was was mistaken because I yeah I hadn't seen it before either because I it's, agree with you I mean it's it, Texas today, I, yeah yeah see they have their own rules down there <laughs> in Texas yeah uh, yeah I'm, um, I'm about to do a little Google search yeah. yeah so I don't have a a radiograph but the scout from the CT is going to have to suffice here and this is interesting because first of all the the cardiac contours look a little weird and then you've got this extra opacity right-sided and this extra opacity left-sided now i don't know with the you know we still see paravertebral interfaces and a little bit of a descending aorta here we're not going to read too much into it on this on the scout but we find this is the ct and so on the left side you can see that there's this extra pulmonary either pleural or mediastinal thing and it's kind of intermediate attenuation on the right side there's a lower attenuation thing which is well circumscribed so this one certainly you know, would be a good look for a foregut duplication cyst and a good location as well probably a bronchogenic cyst behind the bronchus intermedius this one you know maybe it's protonaceous esophageal duplication cyst so what do you guys think? Two, two bronchogenic or two foregut duplication cysts of, of differing attenuation? So some MR sequences here. I don't, I don't know what this, you know, there's a little bit of weird fat set going on, but I'll show here you can see that they're both fluid attenuation. And the answer is yeah, that yes, these are both duplication cysts. They were taken out at different times. I'm not sure why, but they were both removed. And there was no comment on whether or not one of them was more protonaceous than the other. Mm -hmm. I looked, but yeah. yeah, it's a patient with bilateral duplication cysts. Were, were they both? Oh. What, what was the epithelial lining of them? Were they both bronchogenic? I, good question. I don't remember. I'll have to look. I'll look back and see. I mean, that's really strange. I mean, that's it crazy. Is, yeah, this is a good image too, just showing different attenuations on the same in the same image. I'm sure the coronal is even better here. If I, you know, it's an older case that I just happen to come across. Yeah, no, that's so. wild. Can you can you check to see in pathology? Yeah, what, I will. What, I, when you're when you're uh, when somebody else yeah, is showing case, I'll look really. I've quick. never seen anything. I mean, that's crazy. That's really nice. Let's see. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to show. Yeah. So. A little bit of an eye test on the radiograph. If anybody sees anything they want to comment on. Um, oops. I'm trying to decide whether the right hilum is entirely normal or whether there is an abnormal opacity in an interface there, but I'm not sure. It may just be bedside radiography. The, so a little bit of calcification here. There's too much stuff in the aorta, and I wouldn't say this prospectively. And also, look here. There's like two different. This is all retrospective from knowing what's on the CT. Uh, but in the the aorta and the, the aortic arch and descending aorta just look a little wonky there. And mm. uh, this is this is only the second case that I can remember of this. And without associated congenital heart disease. And this is an older patient. You can see they have bilateral superior vena cavae, but on the left side, it's 
hemiazygous continuation and then into the superior intercostal vein, into this left SVC, and then down into the coronary sinus as expected. The right goes into the, into the SVC, into the right atrium as expected. But it's true hemiazygous continuation of the inferior vena cava that there's no, um, you'll see there's no infrahepatic IVC on the right and the only vessel you have in the abdomen is on the left. Mm -hmm. So it's hemiazygous continuation then all the way up and you can even see that the azygous vein crosses into the hemiazygous here. Nice. So yeah, so I thought this was just a, a an unusual variant to be seen in isolation without associated congenital heart disease. And now that I'm looking, I just, this is the first time I noticed this, but the right coronary artery looks like it has a medial and a high tubular origin there. So maybe that's, that's Caney's law right there. That's the second thing. But yeah, I don't know if anybody can comment on the radiograph further. I was looking at this more and this is, I mean. Normal. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Travis, there, there is a second density. Um, if you look over the left main bronchus, there's two vertical interfaces. Yeah. And that's yep. it. That's and that's so subtle. Yeah. This one's not as subtle, but I have an a old radiograph for follow-up that uh, is nice. And I'll just show the lateral view. And I'll show the old lateral for comparison. Because one of my colleagues actually picked this up and was a good call recently and was spot on. And so you can see either you notice first that the trachea is deviated anteriorly or you notice that the retrotracheal space or Raiders triangle mm -hmm. there's too much stuff here and it kind of i think it even comes down a little bit you know a little extra opacity but some of that's arm as well um, but you know and i can let's see which one's the pa view here yeah. maybe there's just too much stuff here but again pa normal but here's the ct and what's interesting about this, it's an older patient, and this is all you know, impacted stuff and, and dilated esophagus. And we were worried about a cancer, but they uh, scoped the patient. This was all just food, and there was a, a stricture, a benign appearance stricture. Now, they haven't confirmed that, but they didn't see a mass and um, were unable to pass the scope all the way, but they saw a, a, like a, a severe focal stricture that looked benign. But just a nice, uh, a nice lateral for everyone. So I'll stop there. All right. Very nice. Seth, are you back in business? Yeah, I'm back. I'm back up. All right. Uh, so this is a patient with MRIs a few months apart, and on the short axis on the left which is done uh in july of last year you can see pretty classic findings of pulmonary hypertension a there's dramatic d-shaped flattening of the septum during systole the rv is large and quite hypertrophy you see trabeculation hypertrophy and then this is him and also this is a post contrast they did their ssfp's post and you can actually even see here that there's uh, some delay, some insertion point enhancement, uh, which I can pull up the delays, but there it's there. Now this is the patient's uh, four months later, five months later, and you can see not only has the trabeculation in the RV dramatically improved, but there's no longer any flattening of the septum during uh, systole. So the pulmonary hypertension has resolved. Uh, another thing to try to point out, which is a little bit, is that the PA size is also much smaller. So this patient, um, I'll show you the CT, and it, it's impressive. I mean, I, I've shown, I don't know how many, I, I see cases of this many every week, but it's just impressive. Um, you know, you see a lot of distal disease, and you're like, ah, it's distal disease, you know, these patients it's just little vessels but it's little vessels everywhere now this one wouldn't be missed this is kind of what we would classify as as level three um you know it's segmental and subsegmental. we have cases like this that have that it's all subsegmental, where you really don't see the disease till you get way out into you know 
down here into the distal subsegmental branches. But nonetheless, I mean, this patient went to surgery and, you know, a lot more places are doing um, pulmonary and uh, thromboendarterectomies and people are getting a lot better at it. So we're seeing a lot more just distal disease because it takes much higher level of expertise to remove these distal clots, you know, like these little guys in here. But just a really nice example of, you know, the dramatic improvement of pulmonary hypertension, um, not just on kind of static anatomic imaging, but with cardiac MRI pre and post thromboendarterectomy for distal disease. So, do you guys do cardiac MRI routinely for? Uh, I, I wish I wish we did. I wish we did. Um, the answer is no. The answer is this is a guy who is the head of a radiology department at an outside hospital. Uh, on the East Coast and wanted a pre-op and a post-op MRI and got one. I really wish we had pre-op and post-op MRIs and everybody it would be very, very wonderful thing. Uh, here's the delayed enhancement of the insertion points. Um, you know, I, I'm having trouble getting, I mean, they won't even do post-op CTs. They'll do lots of post-op Nuke Med studies, um, which is about as exciting as, as anything. Uh, and I'll load those up. But yeah, we're we're trying. We we we're we're starting to break through. We we've got them to agree to a pilot study that instead of doing VQ scans pre and post op, that will do dual energy CTs because we've shown them hundreds of cases of dual energy where we're doing you know just a better study. Uh, anyways, uh, and then lastly is a case, another pulmonary hypertension case, uh, but this just highlights, this was called CTEF, um, and PAs get big, we can have big PAs in CTEF, but usually not this massive. Additionally, we have that very nice, um, that's not as nice in this case, but maybe a little bit, a bit of that periarterial or blushing uh, that we see in people with PAH, and th this is a PAH case, uh, the reason I'm pointing it out is this patient had, so has a lot of intimal, so this is kind of intimal thrombus, basically really almost atherosclerosis, but some of it is, is thrombus. It's not, it's not propagated clot that's like coming from a DVT, but you could see that this kind of thrombus along the wall filled um, and occluded this uh, anterior segmental artery in the right upper lobe. And this was sent to us as a, a, a case of CTEF. And we're like, well, this is, you know, it's it's occluded, um, but this isn't from embolic disease causing this. This is basically clot, basically growing into the vessel and occluding it. We we, we see that occasionally. Most of the time it's just layering and, and circumferential and doesn't extend into a vessel or occlude it. But now um, seen enough of these to, to see it occlude more than once but it's just a nice uh what was it what was the cause of the pulmonary hypertension it's ph it's primary okay so this patient underwent a uh, lung transplant and confirmed just uh type 1 ph uh so presumed genetic there's no no known cause in her no congenital heart disease nothing like that i mean she has she does have a left-sided svc but um nothing other than that Anyways, so in in severe pulmonary hypertension, you you know one looks for atherosclerosis, pulmonary atherosclerosis, yes, uh, which may be associated with calcium. But yes. are you saying that you've seen more than one case where there is an extension of that process into a lobar artery, uh, a segmental artery, yeah, or seg segmental. or subsegmental artery, including it, yeah. yeah. Yes, I have. Yeah. Also, look at this vessel, right? This vessel isn't contracted. This vessel has been like this for, you know, a long time where it hasn't really contracted down, which really isn't keeping. I mean, there's some scarring distal to it, but um, we were all pretty confident, you know, the surgeons, myself and the pulmonologist, that this was just in situ thrombus propagating uh, into a vessel. So you could kind of see it around here and, and 
yeah, all around that's here. Impressive. I'm trying to think if I've noticed that before. I can't remember. It usually doesn't. It, it, I mean, we see a lot of, we, we have a, we do a lot of PAH transplants. I mean, yeah. I really wish I could get my pathologist to do some work with me here. Uh, but um, anyways, long story short, I would say of the lot of PAHs that we've seen, especially sent to us for other reasons, um, I may be, this may be the third one I've seen, but they, the, the guys have been here longer, like, oh, we see, you know, that's not, un we see that, that's not uncommon. So, anyways. Cool. Hey, Seth, they were both bronchogenic cysts on pathology. Really? Yep. That's crazy. That's really wild. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I, we had, I, I think I showed a case of a, bron well, one of us did, maybe of a bronchogenic cyst. Uh, I want to say there was a, there was bronchial atresia and then there was like a CPAM or something. <laughs> All four gut malformations. Okay. Um, you guys ever see plexiform uh, angiopathy on, on path on these? Sorry about that. that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Do you guys ever see uh, plexiform lesions on these cases on the PAH, like post transplant on the pathology? Um, yeah, oh, yeah, you mean. Yeah, from I mean that's what you commonly see in the in PAH, right? Yeah, you see the yeah. plexiform lesions of varying size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They all have plexiform lesions. Yeah, I'm still trying to get them to get me center cuts of the lung in the upper lobe so I can figure out what that blushing is, if it's periarterial or hemorrhage or whatever. I mean, I still can't get a straight. I, we have so many lungs, but anyways. Some people I know. Dave said you know he thought they're the plexiform lesions. Specifically, you know, our pathologists say it's not. Um, the, you see the history saying cholesterol granulomas from hemorrhage, which it may be. I, I just really want to get, I'm just curious about it. I really want to get a good answer. All right. Uh, David or Howard? I've got some, Jeff. All right. There we go. Okay, um, let me show you this uh, chest radiograph on a person who has 27 years old who has congenital heart disease. I think it was an AV canal or something like that. Has a defibrillator, slightly big heart, sternotomy wires. And um, this person has had a lot of reporting of exams over the, over the years going back to 2014. So, but uh, one of the findings that people just recognized on the current imaging was this strange coronary sinus. So here's the coronary sinus, slightly big, heading for the right, but never quite making it to the right atrium. Instead, it has a clearly anomalous vessel. This is not unroofing, but there's an anomalous insertion into the left atrium. So this is osteolatresia of the coronary sinus. The usual drainage then is to a persistent left SVC, and that would make it not much of a left to right or a right to left shunt, but draining as it does into the left atrium, it actually is a right to left shunt in this case. So this is a reported but unusual uh, drainage into left atrium. So I'm glad I have the cardiac team in place here. So I would welcome comments from uh, Seth and Travis about whether they've seen anything like this in terms of osteoatresia with a a clear um, anomalous vein draining to left atrium. I think I showed one like a year or two ago. Same same idea. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I I thought somebody had because um, when I saw when I was shown this case, I you know I I leapt on the term osteoatresia. That was the first time I'd ever heard myself say that. So I thought it must have been from the conference that that um, was seated in my thoughts. So, um, you know, it's not, it's probably not, not worth doing anything about because the degree of shunting here would be pretty low. Okay, so interesting anomaly in a person who already had anomalies, Kenny's law. Did, did this patient have an atrial septal defect at some point in time or not? I see, I don't. I mean, I, I'll have to look up and see what the person had in the past. I don't have command of the entire history of 
uh, this person's earlier experience. Yeah, there's 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 a rare syndrome. It's Brigade syndrome uh, that uh, that's like osteoatresia of the coronary sinus, unroofed coronary sinus, and a uh, uh, atrial septal defect. Yep. Ragib syndrome, right? Like okay. like like Rocket Ishmael, Ragib, that R A G H I B. Yes. R R H A G I B. R A G H I B. Yeah, Rahib. Yeah, Rahib. I don't know which one it is. But yeah, no, I showed a case a year ago. I have it from January 2021. Very similar. You know, depending on where th that, hey, this is on Iraq again, sorry to keep interrupting you guys. Um, depending on where that surgery was done, the coronary sinus draining into the LA was an, was an older style repair for AV canal defects with prime ASD. Um, so it was, that guy's 24. So if he was in the mid 90s and not a major center, it could have been purposely done that way as a quote, oh. the final defect. Um, doesn't that look like that? That doesn't look like a surgical anastomosis with the left atrium. It looks like uh, a factory installed huh. blood, don't you think? Well, uh, I think it can be sometimes hard to tell, but the, it, in the 90s, that was a common type of thing to have the coronary sinus strain to the LA. Um, so this may not necessarily be, um, you know. It may it may have been surgical, but I think it can be hard to tell. Okay, well that's a very good point because we were kind of talking about that. I'll I'll see if I can yes. find his history. It may have been at an outside hospital though. But uh, before I post the case, I will um, I'll try to supply all that information. Maybe we can resolve it. All right, this uh, this woman has an abnormal chest radiograph here with a blob here medially and some funny things out laterally and then some stuff in the upper abdomen that seems to be densely calcified and then has <clears throat> this um, CT scan. That's probably not the best window to show you guys. And we have this cystic looking abnormality medially in the right base. And then we have some cystic abnormalities here that seem to be on both sides of the diaphragm. And then we have this calcific stuff over here, kind of a lacy, weird looking calcification down there. Let me see if this looks better here on a soft tissue window. I think it does much better. So lots of cysts in the right lung base and- Male, male person. Is this the, the liver? Is this a kind of sheep, caucus, David? Sheep herder. Sheep, sheep herder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sheep. this is this is echinococcus, and um, and this has been there for you know for many years. I think we have imaging that goes back about eight years, um, and it's now involving the thorax. In the earlier radiographs, it was just confined to the upper abdomen, but it's gotten through. And this person had surgery earlier this week, and I don't know what the what the goal of the surgery was. Generally, they don't. They don't like to operate on these things because of the risk of spilling the contents into the pleural space, even getting an anaphylactic reaction uh, with that sudden uh, immune burden. So they usually are very careful about trying to keep everything contained and not opening up things with surgery. But I'll, I, once again, this is a case that I was shown recently. I don't have command of the history. So I'll try to tell you guys what the rationale for the surgery was and exactly what they did. So this is a kind of caucus, and I will um, I'll get you more history so we can all share. And here, it, I think the coronal nicely shows the continuity between the thoracic and the abdominal lesions here. Okay. Yeah. Mm. And then this um, this person, I think I'm dealing with a new. A new case here. I hope so. Okay. So let me show you a, a man who was hiking, a 30, 37 year old man who was hiking on Mount Hood in Oregon in uh, late December and uh, found himself short of breath. 
And so in January, he, in December, I think he went to the ER, and then in January, he went to the ER again. He was more short of breath after being sent home with Augmentin or something like that. And this is a CT scan from um, January, mid-January, with a lot of ground glass everywhere. Um, 37 years old, has a seven, currently has a seven-month-old daughter, lives with his fiance, um, and he was short of breath and had this. And he was, you know, he was hiking. Um, he has no past medical history of anything. So ground glass abnormality. And um, let me show you some later imaging on him. That was the 11th, here's the 16th, just uh, a few days later. And you can see that the ground glass stuff has gotten denser. And then particularly in the bases, uh, we're really starting to get even denser consolidation. This is what a early radiograph looked like on him. And you can see the widespread ground glass stuff. Now this tube thoracostomy was after a biopsy. So they biopsied the right lung. This was not spontaneous pneumothorax. But later he developed spontaneous pneumothorax on the left and on the right. And his lung disease got worse. And he is currently admitted uh, and is on um, um, a heart lung machine now. So um, a lot of tests were done and things like that. Um, he was HIV negative um, at the outside hospital. They didn't identify any infectious organisms. Um, they reviewed the pathology here. And I think I can show you um, this path specimen here. So there are these um, little round things here, these little yeasty looking things. So he said, maybe this is cryptococcus, or maybe it's pneumocystis. Uh, in the meantime, it turns out he's profoundly lymphopenic. And um, he was retested for HIV, and it came back positive. And he has a high viral load. So I don't know whether he converted his test or was a false negative in January, but strongly positive. And so the diagnosis of pneumocystis was eventually made on this man. Wow. So it took it took about three weeks to make the diagnosis, and he was just getting progressively more short of breath. People were not suspecting pneumocystis. And uh, he's currently unable to um, give much history since he's intubated and everything like that. So people don't really know what the what the reason for what the immune compromising act was. He lived, he was at the embassy in uh, Kabul for 12 years. He's not traveled in the last two years outside the Northwest. So it's not any recent exposure, but to get to, to you know, AIDS from HIV exposure is usually about eight or nine years. So this is probably something that he might have uh, acquired while he was in Afghanistan. So um, really bad pneumocystis. I can, when I post the case, I'll show you some later CT scans that showed the development of cysts in his lungs, which popped and led to the pneumothoraces that he had on both sides. But the reason the organism is named pneumocystis, it's not because of the lung cysts that we see on CT scans. It's because of the cystic appearance of this, of the organism here, which looks like uh, a little parasitic cyst. So originally pneumocystis was thought to be a parasite. It's now, um, you know, it's now considered to be a fungus, but it's this yeasty looking thing here. This is the reason that it's called pneumocystis because of the microscopy findings, not the CT findings. I thought you okay. were going to show us a case of pneumonic uh, plague from a marmot he met while hiking on Mount Hood. That's what I was thinking. You know, I thought this was going to be some zoonosis that he mm -hmm. picked up there because we've seen, you know, we've seen people with exotic uh, infections from hunting and things like that and animal carcasses. Yeah, that's what I was I was hoping for. And then I thought maybe, you know, maybe it's toxoplasmosis. Maybe, he was, you know, he was um, feeding uh, mountain lions or something like that. Okay, guys. All right. All right, Howard, do you want to go? Okay. Do you have cases, Jeff? I can show just like one case. Yeah, I, I have several. I can show one as well or something like that. Uh, I'll just show one and okay. I'll save them. 
my other ones for next time, that's fine. Let's see which one is kind of nice to look at. This is a nice image. So this is a patient that is known to have scleroderma. And as you'll see in a moment, he's got imaging findings in his lungs, very consistent with connective tissue disease, associated lung disease, particularly severe in the lower lungs where foci of traction bronchiectasis are present. So we've seen that, but of course I'm showing you this for the calcifications or I believe they're dendroform ossifications. So let me quickly make a MIP, um, not so thick maybe of that and take a look at that. Um, these certainly have the appearance of dendroform ossifications. Of course, that's a presumptive diagnosis, but they're I think pretty typical for that. So if so, then I think we've shown dendroform ossifications as an idiopathic entity with surrounding normal lung. We've shown it in the context of an imaging pattern of UIP um, and this one consistent with presumably fibrotic NSIP. And then the other association that people talk about, but I'm not sure I've seen one conclusively is aspiration. But this is a, a pretty dramatic example of, of that. Everyone agree that these are dendroform ossifications? Yes. Yeah. We actually reviewed a case this week in our ILD conference that was a, was a patient with pulmonary ossification who had no underlying fibrosis um, and had fi findings highly suggestive of aspiration. Um, there's a, there was a paper from, uh, I want to say Mayo or it was, James Gruden's group or wherever where he was at the time that looked at non-UIP DPO and I if I um, Chris Meyer had mentioned it to me the other day but uh, it um, I, it showed that they were all aspirators and I, we've seen I see them not infrequently and they all have hernias or stuff in their esophagus and findings that are highly suggestive of aspiration so uh, I think it's uh, very I think it does occur quite frequently. I think it's it's probably under recognized because we don't necessarily CT everybody aspirating. But but those cases, I think, typically when it's related to aspiration, have more of an aspiration distribution, meaning they're more central you know, along lower low bronchi and things right. like that. They're, right. They're going to skip the center parts of the lung and just somehow land out at the periphery like this. Right. So I think distribution is distinctive. Yeah. And they t they if they have underlying fibrosis, it tends to be very mild and just in the bases or on one like we had one case where it was, it was fairly asymmetric because the patient probably slept on their right side most of the evening. And the other the other thing to keep in mind is that sometimes this is a pattern of amyloid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I've, I think I've only seen it once with NSIP, so this is impressive. Yeah, it is, isn't it? And I, I have I'll seen show it some on next time, Jeff. I'm sorry? It's reported in asbestosis and I've seen it. I've mm -hmm. seen one, one or two cases of asbestosis with it. Yeah, okay. it's interesting. Okay. Okay, I can, I can show one case as well. Uh, since we're on the ILD theme, I'll, I'll show an ILD case here. Let's see, where am I? All right, so let's go to, here we go. So this is a young patient, and I want to say in 30s or 20s, and I'm going to start with an old radiograph. I had to crop it to get some old uh, flash. This is an old digitized film screen. Um, but anyway, um, this person you can see has some abnormality here in the upper lobes, primarily sort of along the, um, the, the airway distribution there, uh, preserved lung volume. Here is the lateral view that we see that sort of that upper lobe, just that fine irregularity. The lung bases look pretty good. Uh, jump ahead nine years uh, later, and this radiograph has become quite abnormal. Let me brighten it up a little bit. There we go. So we see this sort of peribronchial um, reticulation. There may be some bronchiectasis or cystic spaces. There's a lot of holes here. Um, there's a little bit of distortion on the hyla. So you might think about, could this be sarcoid or you know, HP, although I like to see more basal disease with HP as well, just kind of a little bit more down there. And then uh, had a CT, here's, a, here's the most recent chest radiograph. 
um, you can see it's gotten a lot worse and now it's becoming more diffuse. The volumes are getting smaller. So, but you can see there's, there seems to be holes in the lung. But um, I would wonder about sarcoid just given the, the symmetry and the upper lobe predominance. So here's the CT scan done uh, a, about uh, a year before that last radiograph. And you can see there's these large sort of irregular cystic spaces in the upper lobes. There's airways, there's a bronchovascular bundle passing through this. So um, it looks almost like emphysema in some areas. Um, and then there's this uh, kind of just subtle ground glass around a lot of these airways. And, you know, I, I mean, it may be sarcoid, but it, it's just not the typical appearance. There are some nodules here. Um, but this, this patient has a history of GATA2, G-A-T-A2 uh, deficiency. It's a, it's a um, transcription factor mutation. Um, I wasn't that familiar with it. I vaguely remember, I don't know if we've seen a case here or, or hearing about it. So I, I, found, um, I found a paper on the pulmonary manifestations. And the, the major one that's reported is alveolar proteinosis. And this accounts for the majority of cases of alveolar proteinosis that don't have uh, anti-GM CSF antibodies. So around 90% of, of, of alveolar proteinosis is associated with that, that autoantibody. And then the remaining 10 um, can be are, can be related to secondary causes or familial, um, but in in some studies they found that, that many of those 10% have this GATA2 uh, deficiency. So this is the most common appearance. But they report other findings, and this nodular disease kind of looks perilymphatic to me as well. Um, and then they show a case of some mild fibrosis here. I don't see a case of weird cystic emphysema this lung. I mean, maybe a little bit there, but uh, like the the case I showed, but um, yeah, this is all related to GATA2 deficiency, and it's a um, it's its main function is in uh, cell uh, cell stability, and uh, it primarily affects the hemopoietic system um, line of cells. So these patients, uh, the main treatment is is a bone marrow transplant uh, to improve survival with it. And I don't know much more about it. I, I kind of just read through the article quickly because I was curious about the um, imaging manifestations. But have any of you ever seen a GATA2 mutation or deficiency case? No, no, that's dramatic. It, yeah, it is. <clears throat> Gosh. But it's been, you know, it's been progressing over well over a decade. Um, but uh, yeah, I, the, the only thing, I mean, if you look in the literature, it all talks about alveolar prognosis. So a weird case of, and I don't know what to call this. It's not really honeycombing. It's not really emphysema. It's sort of cystic destruction of the lungs, but I don't know, looking at the radiograph again, I mean, I would still wonder about sarcoid or even LCH if you didn't have the older one. Right. right. But this looks sarcoidy. Yeah. It looks LCH-y too. I mean, yeah. I think that's what right. I thought this was going to be, Jeff, given all those holes. But uh, but your article showed, said that there was emphysema, paraseptal emphysema, and I think I think you've really got a lot of emphysema. I think the yeah. holes are better described as emphysema than than cysts because they do have those residual tissue right. strands. Of so I've seen three cases of GATA2 deficiency, but they were all uh, people with MDS or leukemia. Mm -hmm. I didn't see lung disease in them. Yeah, that's right. They do get MDS and, and AML, or, a PA, or is it PMML? I think it's PMML. So interesting but yeah this was yeah. kind of crazy because I, I saw this history i was like i don't know what this is so non-smoker right yeah non-smoker wow yeah that's very strange i remember that um in certain like uh fibrotic disorders uh, you can get cystic disease and we just don't really understand exactly how it evolves if i'm correct i remember travis showing us a case of copa syndrome that unusual etiology of a fibrosing lung disorder in which part of it was cystic disease in the involved regions. So I think there's a lot we don't understand about the evolution of cysts or the just disappearance of lung mm -hmm. in these strange interstitial disorders. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll dig around more if I can see if I can find some more stuff. But that, that seemed to be the most comprehensive article I came across. So, all right, guys. Well, great cases this week and good to have everyone back. And I will talk to everybody next week. Cheers, man. Thanks, sir. Thanks, guys. Thanks.